Steve Amit again, another Bullseye Guy podcast coming to you this morning, Los Angeles still uh, relatively early. For those of you keeping track, it doesn't really matter. 5.30 a.m. getting ready for the Milken Global Conference. Love that. Uh, great, great organization. Amazing job that, that Michael uh, Milken and Cloudin and the team has done. And that's relevant today for the topic we're going to talk about, which is funding, traditional funding, structured funding, actually bond funding. Now, for some of you, this may be boring. For others, you may say, well, what is it? But I'm always interested. And for some of you, you're like, aha. This to me, what we're going to talk about will be one of the biggest generational shifts of financial uh, funding and financing. Really interesting of what's going on. We started looking at this over uh, a year ago, really putting some time and effort into it. And a gentleman, I won't mention his name, uh, but I like giving credit. So initials WG, which means he can always get credit uh, without exposing his name. A lot of confidential conversations happen here. But uh, here we go. We're going to talk about green bonds, green bonds and blue bonds. What are green bonds? What are blue bonds? And why do bonds even matter? Before we go forward, let's back up. Bond funding is nothing new. This is a multi trillion dollar industry of traditional funding for big projects companies countries governments institutions if a if a if a city or state or government or country wants to build an airport they want to build a new deep sea port they want to build a rail system infrastructure uh transportation mobility food a lot of these big projects were funded traditionally and historically through bonds and bonds are nothing more than a simple debt instrument now those of you that may be in bonds you're like oh we know this maybe you you know a lot of it you may not know a few things for those of you who don't maybe it's a a little educational and i like that but a traditional bond is is in essence uh a 10-year debt that says oh we we need a billion dollars to build an airport we're going to do 300 million in private partnerships and then we're going to take 900 million in a debt a bond and that bond will be paid off over 10 years with what's called a coupon or an interest rate. And a lot of times like airports are great because you pay the coupon out of the airport fees, which is the revenue that can offset the bond payment. So for big in institutional investors, these are relatively, for the most part, not always, again, we we, we have historical norms around the edges, um, relatively safe and, 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 and long-term. And they're they're not equity. They're not big returns. They're not technology investments. They're long-term, stable, 8, 10, sometimes higher percentage return on a traditional bond infrastructure. And that's a it's a it's a tried, it's a true, it's a historical system that's very well articulated and in place. Green bonds are nothing more than sustainable bond funding. What makes it a green bond? Again, before we go forward, let's go backwards. Uh, those of you that have been in sustainability for a while are looking at, again, all the acronyms, SDGs, ESGs, CSRs, uh, CSGs, the social governance, the employee governance, the sustainable development goals by the United Nation. <clears throat> Many years ago, there's something called LEEDS certified. And LEEDS certified simply means if you take a building, uh, a lot of times it's a retrofit building, you're gonna go into a building you're going to say, hey, we're going to take this building and we're going to repurpose, refurbish, remanufacture. Um, we're going to put solar on it. We're going to put glazing on the windows. We'll try and do some cool stuff in the parking lot where it's solar lighting. Like, What can you do to make a building more environmentally efficient, more environmentally friendly? And there's there's social implications of that. There's There's financial implications. Sometimes there's um, discounts and funding and things like that. But LEED certified is a very existing tried and true process where you can take a building and it's a checklist of things that becomes LEED certified or LEEDS platinum, even higher, right? LEEDS platinum certified means we've hit, we've hit the, the, the pinnacle on this. So there's companies out there that can go in and get a building LEED certified. And you'll see why that's important in a minute. So the certification process is there. For traditional bonds, there wasn't a certification process. It's, is there a prospectus? What does that prospectus say? Uh, what does it do to qualify to show that the bond can be repaid? What's the collateralization? 
And the process basically was you get a bond, try and get it approved, get it listed on a QCIP. Again, a bunch of acronyms. Those of you that know it, otherwise, there's a QCIP where you get to qualify for a number and it's listed on a qualified exchange. And once it's on that exchange, then institutions can quote buy that paper. And these are terms some of you may know, some of you may have heard, but Basically, when the bond is there and listed and qualified, it makes it easier for big institutions. Historically, I believe it's $100 million and up. It's what it takes to qualify to buy these particular bond or debt instruments. So it's big pensions and hedge funds and institutions and some family offices that qualify, but it's big institutions looking for relatively stable returns against a, a qualified project that can give them that 10% return. It's not venture. It's a different type of investment structure. All right. And so now you've got a project, you've got a qualification, you've got a listing and a syndication that, that will pick up the funding. And that's historically how bonds have worked. Well, there's a lot of impetus and movement towards the alphabet soup of ESG, CSR, SDG. Uh, again, those of you that are in the space know what that means. But a lot of companies and countries are trying to say, oh, let's let's be more environmental, right? And if you look around the world, there's there's countries that we know of. There's one particular country, fascinating, has a, a historically old city. And by old, I mean not U.S. old. I joke, the United States, we're, we're an amazing country. We've got a, a great history. But there's other countries who have toilets older than our country in the U.S., so... Um, in, in terms of historical infrastructure, some of these cities, this particular one has things that are thousands of years old. As you can imagine, trying to rebuild an, a city that's thousands of years old is difficult, cumbersome, and complicated. And this particular government uh, and country has tried to do that. What they're they're going to do is actually just rebuild a whole new downtown. But they're not going to refurbish, repurpose, or remanufacture their existing one. They're going to build a brand new one miles outside and just say, let's start from scratch and use all the best technology, all the best infrastructure. What can we do to build a brand new city in a brand new way? And it's not just a, this country, the, the the United Arab Emirates. Again, I love the, the UAE is doing amazing. We spent some time with Saudi, uh, with Neom and what's called the line. Whether you like Saudi or not, I don't, I don't pick sides. There's some people... It's not for me. What I do know the Saudis are doing is they're big on the environmental aspect of how can they do things in an environmental way. Environmental action reports, everything they do, these big, massive projects are all qualified and certified under an environmental moniker. And so they are looking at the environment and how can they do things. And they're they're actually building something in, in Neom, a, a fascinating city. I believe they're going to spend a trillion dollars on it and build uh, a, an infrastructure city called the line. And we just saw it the other day. It was a, a, a floating pop-up moving through different cities and it had come through Boston and Miami and Los Angeles. And the line is intriguing. Well, will it work? I hope so. It's imagine it's vertical living. So I don't know quite how to describe it. Imagine um, a building that, that's, a certain amount wide, so like a skyscraper, but that skyscraper goes straight up 500 feet or so. The outside is all glass, so you can look out. It's all sustainable. And then there's a little bit of a, a block or two in between and then another vertical, but it's not a building like traditional. It's a line. So this building goes up vertically and then it's 35 or 40 miles long. It goes through, I believe, four different ecosystems, ecological it goes through deserts and through the mountain and ends up all the way out at the ocean where this vertical building pops up out of the desert and out into the ocean. And now you've got boats that can pull up and and the, the vertical line has has gardens going across. It's, it's amazing. It's fascinating, but it's intriguing in that they're building it with complete sustainability. It's, it's solar, it's water, it's reclamation, it's vertical takeoff, it's all electric. It's regenerative food. They're building an entire city in the middle of an ecosystem and they're holding 95 or 96% of the ecosystem around it. The environmental impact, the footprint is very small. A traditional city, if you tried to do that, would span out and take 
hundreds or thousands of acres. It would be miles and miles and miles. Think of Los Angeles or even London. It's a big footprint. They're actually compressing all of that down to a very small impact on the environment. All right, fascinating what's going on. Well, all of those projects, all of those massive infrastructures are going to need to be financed. Now, the Saudis, not so much. I mean, I think they're in a fortunate place. They write their own checks to fund their own projects, but they're still doing them under an environmental moniker. Where am I going with all this? It's important. Green bonds are going to finance a lot of the global infrastructure that's going to potentially help change the world. Now, again, I do I think I can change the world as a single person? No, my impacts are minimal. But some of these big projects, I, I think, could have a meaningful impact. Whether you believe, again, in climate change or not, I'm not here to, to pick sides. What I am here to do is use the old moniker of Ghostbusters, one of my favorite and those of you that are old enough might remember Ghostbusters, great scene on top of the building. This is Ghostbusters 1. The, the Ghostbusters are up there and there's this little minx god and looks at the Ghostbusters and says, are you a god? One Ghostbuster looks at the others. And those of you that, that know it will quote the line with me. I've had people do this, but says, no. And the little minx god says, and die. And, you know, fire and, and and lightning comes out of her fingertips and rocks are flying off the top of the building. Ghostbusters are hiding and she stops. And when she, she stops, you know, trying to kill him, one Ghostbuster looks at the other and hits him and says, hey, if someone asks if you're a god, you say yes. If someone asks if you're a god, you say yes. What do I mean by that in this parameter? There's $10 trillion or more. We learned this last year uh, again, a lot of this we started learning at Milken about two years ago, really fascinated with it last year, started putting together, for those of you, actually, this is an announcement. We're putting together a company called Green Wave Funding. I love the double entendre, green, wave, blue, green. Green is the the, the environmental blue, is just the environment for the ocean and water. So Green Wave Funding, What what do I mean by that? So there's over $10 trillion of money that's been allocated for for environmental impact investing. Now, this isn't money allocated for impact investing at the startup level. It's not venture. It's not equity. There's a lot of money for what we call impact investing. A lot of venture guys are moving over saying, hey, we're going to do impact investing. We believe in SCG. That's great. And it'll happen. And those returns have been um, spotty and sketchy, but long-term they'll be there. Traditional funding, These, this is trillions of dollars by the biggest banks and institutions in the world. A bunch of banks with acronyms that you would know, a bunch of banks with umbrellas that you would know, and a couple banks named after metal that you would probably know. $10 trillion. And what I find interesting with money, uh, if you look at venture, if somebody raises a venture capital fund, right? if you have money, money wants to go somewhere, money wants to be deployed for a return. Money is circular. It's an energy. The purpose of money is not to sit on it. It's be deployed for a return purpose or value. So money wants to go somewhere. When money is deployed into a venture capital or pension fund, money needs to go somewhere. Now, it may not need to go right away, right? If valuations are up or deals aren't there, that money needs to go there, but it doesn't have to. It can wait until valuations or economies or, or circumstances changes. We were in a conversation the other day. Um, we're trying to help close a $300 million deal on a great company. This is a really cool company. It's a solar car. I won't mention the name again. It's confidential. May or may not happen, but it's a solar car, not an EV, not an electric vehicle. Do you like EVs or not? Again, not for me to decide, but there, there's some positive externalities of electric vehicles and there's some downsides, right? A full solar doesn't have batteries. Why is that important? Batteries are, are, are a bane a bit of the electric vehicles. Getting a battery out to actually build a battery, a lot of impact on the earth and digging the lithium out and where does the, the lithium come from and what countries and what's what's the labor to do that and, and what's the environmental impact and what's the human impact of a lot of that mining to get the lithium out to make the battery that goes in your electric car for you to go home and not be able to plug your car in. If you own an electric vehicle, you have to charge it. If you don't have charging stations at your home, then you're relegated to the convenience or inconvenience of finding a charging station, waiting in line, hoping like in California, half of them are broken or there's a long line. So you've got this, this aspect of what does the EV do? And when it's plugged into the grid, 
In California, for instance, last year, the governor was saying, don't plug your car in. Well, you buy an electric vehicle to plug it in, to use electricity to drive, but you can't drive. Again, I'm not picking sides, but we have to look at things practically and go, hmm, what's really happening here? So the EV movement is big. Are there better technologies? Are there better solutions? This solar vehicle we think is really cool. It's a two-wheeler. No, it's a three-wheeler, so it qualifies as a motorcycle uh, for taxes, goes on the road, flexible solar panel, 1,300 miles, two gull wings. It looks like a rocket ship. It's really, really cool. Those are the type of projects that are going to get funded that you say, oh, these are interesting things that can really kind of change the world. And so green bonds and blue bonds are looking to qualify into projects. But when we were on the call, where am I going with this? It seems circular for the circular economy. It's not, there's a, a particular person on this phone call does a lot with government. And, and I, I said, here's what I believe for money. Money wants to go somewhere. Money needs to go somewhere. That's good. When money is mandated to go somewhere, it's a game changer. And mandated means it must by government decree be allocated. What do I mean by that? Within the US, whether again you believe in it or not, the current administration, we're in 2023 here, is trying to push mandated ESG environmental governance, funding, and investing. They're trying to move pension funds and government funds into qualified investments that qualify as ESG or environmental. They're trying to mandate money over into this ESG sustainable compliance world. All right, so what do we have? We have $10 trillion of money backed up that not wants to go somewhere, needs to go somewhere, and is getting mandated. You have big infrastructure projects. You don't have enough projects that have qualified for sustainable green or blue bonds. And what do I mean by qualify? Let's go back to leads. Lead certified says, hey, here's a building that qualifies under a lead certification. Here's your badge. Thank you very much. The sustainable world needs the same thing. It has a few companies globally. There's one we're, we're going to partner with for this Greenway funding system we're putting in place. We're going to look for big projects, governments trying to build you know billion dollar airports, food sustainability, security, transportation, solar cars, like really cool fun things, even mining environmental eco mining can you redo a mine where you're still mining earth materials but doing it in a more environmental and friendly way can you find qualified projects can you help get them certified prospectus everything certification where they're qualified for that green bond status list them on an exchange there's only a couple exchanges in the world we're actually going to probably build one and take one over in in a caribbean i think they're caribbean i'll just say what it is bermuda because they always confuse me. I don't think they're Caribbean. My Bermuda team, please don't hold that against me. We're going to use Bermuda to, to build an actual green bond exchange. There's a couple other ones in the world. Help get the bonds that we qualify listed on the exchange and then syndicate them out. Get them placed and funded to do really cool projects around the world. And, and so this particular podcast was a little educational, a little informative, a little self-serving for what we're trying to get in front of. If someone asks if you're a God, you say, yes, $10 trillion or more sitting there wanting to go into projects. Those projects, if qualified, could help revolutionize and change the world. And we want to be a small part of that if, if you count $10 trillion being small. So the bullseye guy, Stephen Mead, thanks so much. A little shorter today. I'm running out the door to the Milken Global Conference in Los Angeles. Uh, again, fascinating group. Any of you guys that, that can ever attend some of these upper economic events, they're really great. Guys work super hard to put them on. Anthony Scaramucci at SALT, uh, Jason and the team at Bloomberg for Qatar Economic Forum, Milken. Um, there's, there's, I know there's some others. Oh, Richard Atias in the FII group. There, there's a few that are that upper elite of economic how do you change the world and, and make a difference? And, and we're fortunate to be a part of that. So enjoy your day again. Steve and me, the bullseye guy. Thank you so much.